We are honored and privileged to have John Morgan from Orlando, Florida, the managing partner and founder of Morgan & Morgan Law Firm, not only in Florida, but nationally. John is a graduate of the University of Florida undergrad, University of Florida Law School, and has been practicing for over 30 years in the Orlando area, not to mention the Florida area. He's author of two books. He's a mastermind of legal marketing, running law firms, law firm management, and he has now the largest plaintiff firm in the United States. So welcome, John. It's a privilege to talk to you today. Great to be with you. I'd rather be with you at Newport Beach like this summer. but Yeah, well, unfortunately, we got to get back to work here. All right. So, John, first of all, would you tell our listeners just a little bit about the firm, the size of the firm, the offices, and, and the practice areas? <clears throat> Well, the firm, the firm was started in 1988. There was just two of us. Uh, we had, we went on television. That was the big, the big deal. I, my other firm, I broke up. I wanted to advertise and they didn't. And so I took one of my associates and we started a firm in 1988. And there was just two of us. We had a hundred thousand dollar a year budget. Today, fast forward, we have, we'll spend almost $90 million in all marketing. I mean, billboard, internet, TV, everything. We have uh, 50 offices around America and 450 some odd lawyers. So we're 30 years old this year. And um, it has been, you know, if you blink, you miss it. Well, I, I have personal experience. I've seen it. I, I'm, I'm beyond impressed. But first question for our listeners would like to know, managing all that, those people, all those lawyers, do you have formulas? Do you have strategies? How do you manage so many lawyers and employees? The first thing you have to do, I think, is you have to figure out, you have to, you know, to scale you have to have great managers. Sometimes you're going to miss, sometimes you're going to hit. And I have had misses. Uh, the key thing when you have a manager that doesn't work, when I talk about a manager, a managing partner of a city, you have to move on them and, and take them out as soon as you know it's wrong. But once I get the managing partner that I know is my forever manager, and I kind of look at them like this, Brian, I call it the send delete test in this world. Sometimes you'll send an email to somebody and you know, with certainty that you don't have to do anything else that you can delete that because you know, it's going to be handled. Then on the other hand, you've got other people in your office or your organizations that you send a message to or a directive to or an order to, but you're not so sure, so you don't delete it. You know, a case comes in. You forward it, somebody sends me a case, and I say, so-and-so, grab this case. I know with certainty that's going to that's gonna be handled. I delete it. Somebody else I'm not so certain about, I may keep it, and a day later write back, did you get this? Once I know that I have what I call a send delete person, that is the person that I can send it to, delete it, and never worry about it. Once I get that person in my organization, then we start really running on all cylinders. And then at that point in time, once you identify that person, and it doesn't have to be lawyers, it can be your you know, bookkeepers, CFOs, HR, whatever. But once you get these people in place, then you can, what I call, delegate ruthlessly. And it's very important that everybody has a role. I have a saying to the firm, Brian, that if everyone is accountable, no one is accountable. So in all of our cities and all of the operations, we do our very best to make sure that every single task, every single job is identified so that if something happens, we have somebody we can go to and say, that was yours. Tell us what happened. Well, I, th I think accountability in a law firm is key. One, one concept that I, I used that you developed 
and I'm not sure which book it was in, where every year you evaluate all employees, lawyers down to the delivery people, to the whoever filing people, and you give them letter grades. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, now I'm not as ruthless as Jack Welch was. Jack Welch in a book he wrote called The GE Way, every year he would identify what he called A's, B's, and C's. 20% of his employees were A's, 70% were B's, and 10% were C's. When he would identify the 10%, he would get rid of them. Just boom, they're gone. The 20% who are the A's, under no circumstances can they ever leave your business. And then the B's are two types of B's. You have the B that can turn into an A and be a superstar and one that you can never leave. Or you can have the B, which I call the blocking guard on the football team. The football team has 11 positions. You got the quarterback, you got the halfback. But the people who open up the holes and who really get down in the trenches are the, the, are the guards and the tackles. And those are kind of the Bs that are always going to be a B. No offense to blocking tackles and guards. I don't do the 10% with the C's, but I, once I identify a C, now there'll only be one C or two C's and three C's, but once I identify a C, and that is a person who can never, ever be a B. That is a person who is never going to fit in in our organization. This is a person who is below average. At the end of every year, we go through and we do this exhaustively. There's almost three, not three, 2,700, 2,800 total people in the firm and we identify the C's, and then we have a conversation with them. And what we tell them, we, I hate to fire anybody. I always tell them, listen, this isn't working. It's better to find a job with a job. And in some cases, Brian, Jeff Bezos tells us, sometimes it's better just to pay people to go away. Some people who've been with me for a while, and it's taken me time to really figure out that they're never going to make it. I'll go to them and say, listen, it's not working out. I want to pay you. And, and in some cases, I've paid people up to a year severance. And, but in any event, if you let those folks, if you let those C's linger, then all of a sudden you're a C operation, and then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're fighting for air. So what I take from that is you, you got to be willing to make tough decisions, and everybody knows it's hard to let somebody go. But if it's hurting your organization, you got to do it. Well, it's like, and here's what you got to think about. Look, I come from a place, you know this, that where my dad, he lost, he was always losing his job. So firing somebody is, is terrible for me because I'm still, I can still feel it from my childhood. That's why I'm trying to be a little bit more gentle about it. I'll say, look, it's not working out. It's better to find a job with a job. Start looking, take, your, take all the time you need. But at the end of the day, you have to do it or else you're going to put everybody else's jobs in jeopardy because you get enough bad workers, your productivity goes down and everybody's job at risk. And the truth of the matter is, usually, I know this sounds crazy and you've heard it before, but usually that person, you're doing them a favor. They know, look, we all know what we're good at, what we're not good at. Uh, if somebody said to you, well, Brian, you know, you, you're not a great, you know, dancer, and, you know, unless you're drinking, but if you're not a great dancer, you would say, okay, I can accept that. We know that. We know what we are. Now, a lot of people hide because, you know, who, who can, when nobody's really dancing, nobody sees them dancing, but we know what we can do well. And really, at the end of the day, you do them a favor because then they can move on and get to something that they can be good at and a place that they can thrive in. And I think the key is, as you analogize to the offensive guard, well, when a critical play and the guard misses his block and the quarterback gets sacked, that hurts the whole team. So everybody has a role to play, and if they're not being accountable, the and whole listen, team is going to suffer. And I'll tell, I'll tell you, look, now I've had people 
I've had lawyers who are supposed to be managing a large inventory of cases, you know, hundreds and hundreds of cases, and they couldn't do it. They were not good at that, but I moved them. And one of them, you know, is uh, Drew Felix. Drew was in our PI department, but he just, the, the, the volume of work, it was just, there was just so much, but he's a smart guy. We moved him to products liability where he's got 10, 15, 20 cases. And he's one of our stars. So I moved him from, you know, defensive back to wide receiver. He was a crummy defensive back, but he's a great wide receiver. You can have guys who think they're the quarterback, but they can't be the quarterback, but they can be great defensive backs. So a lot of time, it's a matter of getting the lawyer or your staff person in the right position so that they can succeed. I totally agree with that. Let, let's talk a little bit about marketing. Every lawyer out there knows that, or I don't know if they know it, but they should know that if they don't have cases, they can be the greatest trial lawyer in the world. And if they don't have a case to try, they're not going anywhere. So what tips, what pieces of advice would you give the guys or women or men starting a law firm, personal injury practice, they want to develop a practice, they got to start going out and finding clients or referral sources. What, what advice do you have for them? Well, the, you know, I would get back to the basics from the beginning. One thing you're never going to find is you're never going to find a case or a source sitting at the desk. You got to get out. You got to work it. I built my business by living in union halls, AFL, CIO, CWA, plumbers, pipe fitters, painters, labor, I lived in those places. Every day I would have lunches with criminal defense lawyers, chiropractors, orthopedic surgeons. If you don't get out and put the shoe leather down on the pavement, it's never just going to happen. Hope is not a plan. And But when you get out there and work that angle, things will happen. I would tell uh, all your listeners, Brian, as a very quick read, a book to read called Never Eat Alone. And it talks about how when you put yourself out there, when you go to the convention, when you go to the reception, when you go to the, to the seminar, when you, when you go to the union hall, something's going to happen. Nothing can happen at your house or in your office. You're never going to generate a case in your house or your office, and if you generate one in your office, there's going to be a workers' compensation case against you. So you don't want that one either. So I would say that as far as non-marketing, I'm talking about just you got to get out there, and you know that. I mean, nobody does that better than you. Well, I've yeah. never seen anybody do it. You have, you have your parties, and you have your lawyers, and they're out there, and they're, they are – shoe leather on the ground. So I would say that. And the second thing I would say is, look, marketing is essential. There's, and there's all sorts of ways to go about it. There's the traditional, you know, television, radio, billboard. Uh, I would, I would never tell anybody to do yellow pages. And then the second is the internet. There's two different dynamics. There's the old and there's the new. And the new is really usurping the old because where do we all go now? We go to the internet. When was the last time you ever went to uh, the yellow pages to find a plumber or a painter or transmission place? Never. So it's all on the internet and we are spending, and you've been to Brooklyn where we have our tech center and we have a whole tech center in Brooklyn there are no lawyers there except one, but that is where we do our search engine optimization. That's where we write our articles. That's where we do our YouTube ads. That's where we do everything. And it's like walking into, you know, I call it, and you've heard me call it in speeches, I call it uh, the Google law firm. If Google was a law firm, what would it do? What would it look like? And that's what Brooklyn is. Well, you know, in fact, as in the future, I want to do a number of interviews. And one area I think we want to address is the technology in Brooklyn and what you're doing. 
a simple story that you told me one time that when you first started out and for a while, anytime somebody sends you a case, you would send them a certain kind of wine. And I know you'll know what that is. And then one time, the guy that had sent you a lot of cases, hadn't sent a case for a while, called you and wanted to know where his bottle of wine was. Tell us about that. Well, I call this the why bother. You know, I had a deal where you send me a case, and as soon as you sent me a case, I either sent you a bottle, this is years ago, a bottle of cake bread Chardonnay or cake bread Cabernet. Had boxes stacked up. I get a case, I'd have a runner deliver a bottle of wine. And you say to yourself, you know, you're paying a referral fee, why bother? There's a lot of things that we can say all the time, why bother? And so, but every time someone would send me a case, they would have a bottle of wine and a thank you card. Some people are getting three and four and five bottles a week. My best referring lawyers. And that's okay. I mean, you know, the bottles cost like $28 at Costco. So one day this will just show you the power of the Pavlovian experience. I get a case where a um, Domino's truck had run a red light. And it's one of these deals where uh, the, it was 30 minutes or free pizza and a person uh, was killed by a Domino's truck speeding through a red light trying to deliver pizza within 30 minutes. Gigantic case. So I get a referral from a guy named Jim Perry, who later became Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court, one of my great friends. So he calls me up and one day, and we've signed the case up. I've already set up the estate. And he calls me up and he says, Hey man, how you doing? I said, I'm doing good. Okay. Hey, we get that Domino's case signed up? I said, Oh yeah, we got it signed up. All right. We're going to do okay with that one. I said, my God, this, this, this punitive damages here, Jim. Okay. What's going to happen? So we've already got the estate set up. We're going to file the lawsuit. This is going to be a monster. And then there was a pause. He said, Hey, let me ask you, let me ask you a question, man. I go, what? He said, uh, did you all stop giving out the wine? <laughs> and I'm like, what? Now, remember, he's going to get a gigantic referral fee. But over time, he understood if he sent a case, he got a bottle of wine. $28 bottle of cake bread. And it was so stunning to me. And, you know, we think, why bother? We don't think about it. No, I would never have thought that he's looking for a bottle of wine when he's got a case like this, but he did. He was looking for the bottle of wine. And so what we then did that day is we went down to Costco and we bought a box of Dom Perignon and we delivered that to Jim Perry with my apologies for forgetting his one bottle <laughs> of cake bread. But little things like that, Brian, are powerful. It's what I call the why bother. Why bother with having a whole storage room full of wine and why bother with sending it out to every time somebody sends you a case, having it hand delivered? Why bother? Because we don't know how they're thinking. They're thinking every time I do this, every time I punch the button, a piece of candy comes out. And I'm going to send it to Brian Panish or John Morgan, because I know this, number one, I like them. I've already sent them cases. Number two, it's going to be a good return. And by the way, I'm going to get some immediacy. I'm going to get a bottle of wine. So that whole experience taught me a, a lot of things, that the little things that we do, that we don't think matters, really do matter. And the answer to the question is, why bother? Because it matters. I couldn't agree with you more. So let's say I'm a young lawyer. I've started my firm. I got marketing going. I'm getting cases. I'm hiring more lawyers. I'm hiring support staff. My, I understand you've been working with the company and you've developed a software called Litify. Can you tell us our listeners about that and how that helps in the practice of the personal injury lawyer in a plaintiff firm? 
Well, here's the deal. We got to a point where I said, you know, there's, there's really a three or four legal softwares. It, there's needles, there's trial works, there's client profiles. There may be a couple other ones I'm forgetting. And we just kind of take it. We just kind of, try, we just kind of accept it as that's what it is. And we use it even though it's not great, even though it's really kind of crummy. At a firm last week, Risman Weisberg in Orlando, their whole client profiles was down for a month, not a month, a week. We had to, they canceled two trials with us because they couldn't get theirs up. And I finally said, you know, why are we putting up with this? What if we built the greatest software that could do everything that I wanted to do? I called it magic carpet that I could, I wanted to do this. I wanted to do that. And I want to get on this magic carpet and I want to ride around the house on a magic carpet. What if I just decided to go do my wish list for software? And so we built Litify. Today, we built it just for ourselves, Brian, as you know. And then people started seeing it and they were like, can you, are you going to sell it? We, we really weren't. The way I look at it is, is this, the old softwares, the client profiles and all that, it's like the, I'm living in, I don't know if you've ever been to Havana, but you go to Havana, Cuba, and everybody's driving around in 1957, 1958 cars. And guess what? They're okay with it. They don't know the difference. They've never been out of that. That's just the way it is. You go to China, and people are on bicycles and droves. That's just the way it is. But I said, you know what? I'm not going to drive around in a 1957 Studebaker. I'm going to drive around in a rocket ship. And we built what I believe is a transformational software. When you see the demonstration, you it's jaw-dropping. The intake communicates with the software. It's everything that I wanted to do, we call it Litify. And after we built it for ourselves, now look, it, people don't want to change because it's, it's a daunting thing because you go, oh my God, I got I to gotta migrate my old stuff. But it's like going paperless. And, and, old, and older lawyers don't want to do it. I was with the guys, I, I gave a speech this morning in Cleveland. I'm back in Orlando now, but I was talking to one of the great trial lawyers in Cleveland and he was like, I'm just nervous about going paperless. Yeah, we're all nervous about going paperless. But you have to do it. If you don't do it, you're just stuck in, in running in taffy. And so just like going paperless, I then take, took this. It's what we're on. And we are selling this now, Brian, uh, to law firms across America. There's an intake piece. And there's a full integrated piece. Uh, you can go on your, you can go online and look it up. It's called Litify. And I will tell you this: almost every time we present it, people buy it. And the main reason people don't buy it is they hate the thought of change. Even though people think they like change, they hate the thought of change, and they hate the thought of the migration of of moving the old stuff onto the new stuff. But once you get it on there, you're out of the Studebaker and you're in the rocket ship. It's called Litify, L-I-T-I-F-I. -I, I totally agree. Uh, I'm a proponent of it. It's a great product. Everyone needs to check it out. Contact them. They'll give you a free demo. All right. We're running out of time, but I got one last thing. And one of your sayings that you always have is grow or die. What do you mean? I told them today in Cleveland, I was speaking to the trial lawyers there. I said, on my, on my tombstone, I'm going to have the words of people. If I could have only one set of words, it's going to be called, it's going to be grow or die. And what I mean by that is if you are not constantly in the pursuit of getting better, growing doesn't necessarily mean by size of firm, it can be the mentality of the firm. You know, you have this incredible influence on our firm 
with the whole concept of anchoring high. And anchoring high is a growth mode that instead of saying, hey, we're going to, ex these cases are not really worth a hundred thousand. These cases are worth a million dollars. That's growing, not dying. But what I mean by grow or die is if you're not growing, you are dying. If you're not trying to go higher, you are dying. If you're not going up, you're going down. And, and if you're staying the same, you're, you're, your people are passing you. If you're staying the same, you're in quick saying people are passing you. Now, if I don't put grow or die on my tombstone, I've got a fallback position. And it's going to be, uh, I told you I was sick. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. We got to wrap it up here, but listen, listeners, please be aware that we're going to be putting out more with John Morgan. We're going to talk about some of his books. We're going to talk about his strategies that have been so successful for him running the largest personal injury law firm in the world. Thank you, John. Look forward to talking to you soon. All right. Thank you, Brian. Bye.